right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, let me just show you. I'm here stuck in my home office because I live in one of the more um, strict uh, cities in the United States uh, for the pandemic. Here's where, here, let's do this. Ross Avenue, just to put it in context. Carl's, I live in Carlsbad, California. There we go. Which is in San Diego County, which is very close to the Mexican border. So I am literally across the world from you guys. And man, I wish I was in Oslo or in Norway in general, one of my favorite places in the world. I've actually traveled to Lockselv after speaking at an NDC uh, way up north on the Arctic Circle. And uh, went salmon fishing. I'm a fly fisherman. Uh, one of the most funnest trips of my life. Anyways, this is where I am, and it's seven o'clock in the morning. And my good friend Gregor just told me I stand between you guys and Aquavit, and it's almost Friday night. So let's get rolling. I've got a lot to cover here. I think this is a fascinating topic. Uh, I won't pontificate completely to PowerPoint. Um, I have a number of demos that I I think are jaw dropping, awesome. Um, so, uh, and I just saw a note, someone from Lockself. God, I can't wait to get back there. Lockself in July, where the sun never goes down, so you can fly fish literally 24 7. I assume your nights are getting long, uh, or your days are getting long. Anyways, I'm Tim. Uh, this is how to contact me. If you want my slide deck or anything else, feel free to email me. Um, I'll, I'll put up this email address again at the end. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm not so smart. I'm as dumb as I look. I work for two companies. I have two full-time jobs. One is called Internology, one's called Visibility. We'll talk a little bit about that, but that's not the focus of this. And yeah, I'm the founder of um, the Microsoft Regional Director Program, uh, which was about 20 years ago, one of the founders. And my specialty is uh, artificial intelligence. And yeah, I have gray hair now. Uh, I don't think I had gray hair the last time I went to Lockcell. Um, but I have been privileged throughout my career to um, be the, the demo guy, uh, the demo dolly next to some of the, the most famous executives in technology, not just Microsoft ones. And I'm not a Microsoft employee. I did work when I was a young man, and you can see how young I was standing next to Bill Gates. I did work at Microsoft on a server team as a um, dev lead on an architecture team. Um, and if anyone out there has gray hair and knows this one, I worked on Windows NT, which is a beautiful OS, beautiful server. Um, although, man, I could tell you some stories, but we're not going to talk about that today. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about, um, we're going to pose some interesting questions because as I was telling Gregor before we started that, you know, that artificial intelligence, especially computer vision, where I'm going to focus today is so powerful and does so many great things for the world. But at the same time, it's like a loaded weapon in, in the wrong hands with people without integrity, some bad things can be done. Um, and I'll talk about how we got here and where we're going and, and the stuff we do today. Uh, and I think you'll be surprised and excited and scared all at the same time. Uh, most of the work we do at my company, Internology, very quickly, um, you don't know us. Uh, because we're building software for other companies. Here's some of the ones we can talk about. They're kind of sort of grouped. Every, everyone from the, the giant technology companies like Microsoft, Apple, Google, to the NASA's of the world and things like that. Uh, most of the work we do is protected by NDA, but we have done a ton of broadcast television work. This is a bunch of famous people using our software in broadcast TV. You're familiar with this one. The entire free world has experienced this one. Uh, in November of this year, 250 to 300 million people will experience this one. Uh, we built the prior version of this for CNN. I don't know if they're going to let us do it again in November. I hope they do. But uh, this is God's gift um, to Win32 applications. This is a, a WPF DirectX application, which means it has a, uh, or it doesn't mean this, but it, interestingly enough, it has an SLA of 100%. When you do something in broadcast TV live to the world, it cannot go down. It has to run 24 seven. So you can imagine the pain we went through to get that bad boy to run 
on Windows <laughs> and never crash or never experience memory leaks. So yeah, let's jump in a little deeper. From cancer research and detection to rare disease identification to machine learning on the human genome to COVID-19 detection and recognition, AI does save lives. It saves lives right now and it's been saving lives for years. I'm proud that Internology has been working in computer vision and 3D based solutions for solving cancer for over a decade. Um, so I, I'm i going to play you a little video and I think Gregor and I set this up so you're actually going to be able to hear it. Uh, fingers crossed, uh, just a couple minutes of me doing a demo in a Microsoft keynote recently. I'm not allowed to demo it live. Don't ask why. So I'm just going to play this video. Let me set it up. I met this amazing woman. Uh, her name is Melissa Mulholland. She's an executive at Microsoft um, in AI. Uh, her son had this rare syndrome called pulmonary urethral valve syndrome, PUV. It's fairly, it's a fairly easy, easy procedure to fix if you identify it. But if not diagnosed, it's 100% fatal. The baby dies. Not all physicians are trained to recognize this in ultrasound images. And if missed, it's fatal. So I had a hunch that um, I could build a computer vision trained model to recognize this <clears throat> with the Microsoft Custom Vision API. So I got the training images from Melissa and from the internet and I worked all day on it. And at 3 a.m. I had a prototype done and it worked flawlessly. It's been well publicized um, in the press. So let's just jump in and I'll show you me doing the heart of the demo, which is here, which is here. All right, here we go. Right, that in itself is awesome. But as I was talking to Melissa at three o'clock in the morning, playing around with this, uh, we built a little container, a test container. This is UWP, like I said, this could be anything, this could be, C sharp, it could be Java, it really doesn't matter. It's not styled on purpose, meaning it's, this is not pretty on purpose. This is our test container. This is the engine by which we recognize objects. So I've also got, I'm not gonna use the fancy camera that's on my Surface book, right? It has a really nice camera. In fact, it has a 3D camera that does facial recognition. I'm gonna use a commodity camera that costs $4 at quantity. Okay, you with me? It's a, I've plugged it into a USB, so it's $20. But the camera in your cell phone, in your iPhone or your Android, is basically $4. I don't know if you knew that. Okay, so I'm using the worst case scenario. To add to the worst case scenario. It's a little crumpled, too. <laughs> I've been doing this demo in rehearsal. This is a, an ultrasound. This is a picture of an ultrasound on a cheap screen in a hospital room of Melissa's son. This is it, this is him, this is Connor, right? Without further ado, cheap camera, Microsoft Custom Vision. And you'll notice as I hold this up here and I and you guys turn off those lights that are reflecting on it, this thing gets better and better and better and better as it recognizes this, right? A picture, freaking amazing. But to show you it's not smoke and mirrors, hey, do you guys mind dimming those lights for me again? Here's, here's a crappy picture of an ultrasound that doesn't have PUV in it. And you can see it clearly says, I'm totally confident that that's normal. That's a worst scenario. That's how powerful this technology is. And that's all I got. And it's been awesome to meet you and work with you. Thank you so much. All righty. Um, that I'm very proud of. So, but here's something current. Here's what we're working on right now. Uh, this just went public last week. These are amazing group of scientists from, from um, they're based in, in um, Florida, but they're from all over the world. And we are using the very same technology to detect COVID-19 
in chest x-rays. You're going to get wind of this in the press very soon because with the very same technology, which is Microsoft Custom Vision, they have an object detection model that is so good. If you get the tri right training images, um, you can detect this stuff quite easily. So this has got a lot of people excited. Uh, let's move on. Um, so to put some of the issues of artificial intelligence in terms of privacy violations in context, realize that what you're staring at here all happened around 10 years ago. I don't know if in Nor Norway you know what a target is, but it's a giant Walmart-like um, superstore. God help you guys if Walmart has invaded you. I hope they have not. But Target is a is like a higher end version that my my wife loves it. It's it's a very successful chain in the United States, maybe North America. Anyways, ten years ago they used machine learning to identify and target their pregnant customers. Ten years ago, Apple put a secret tracking file on the iPhone so it could track you. Ten years ago, Google, Facebook, many others. Since then, have created billion-dollar businesses on the unauthorized tracking of your web use, and they still do it. Amazon overcame browser security privacy issues on by design, on purpose, through a weakness in Flash, so they could track you. This is 10 years ago. Um, the power of AI has increased dramatically in 10 years. So let me just show you how it has increased. What, what's new about this world is the compute power, the CPU, and that translates into machine learned models that have tremendous accuracy. Uh, facial recognition, frequently called identification, is a solved problem. It was solved years ago. Uh, it, it's been worked on for over 25 years. The accuracy we get in a group of the top vendors who do facial recognition is ridiculously good. There's this entity that does standardization testing. It's called NIST, National Institute of Standards Technology, something like that. Every four years, for the last many years, NIST has done standardized testing on facial recognition algorithms. This is their latest test from last year. Uh, it includes hundreds of vendors. Uh, there are a top 150 vendors but I believe they test down to like 500. So let me talk you through interpreting these results. This first graph that I've pasted, and if you get my deck, you can go to the actual publication. Uh, this first graph is how good the facial recognition has, has gotten since 2013. So for the last 20 years, NEC, that's the company that runs um, the security facial recognition in the Oslo airport in airports all over the world. And for the last 20 years, NEC has won this thing, hands down, until just recently. So in, in 2013, NEC won this thing with basically 97% accuracy. Cut to today, Microsoft's algorithm, the one that's used in Windows Hello. If you use Windows and you use Windows 10, and you have a, 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 a computer with that special camera, like I'm talking to you from a surf, Surface Book, and it has that special camera, and it authenticates me. I never type a password. It just looks at me and authenticates me. Companies all over the world do this. The Fortune 1000 do, does this. That's the same tech. Um, and Microsoft makes it available to any developer. Anyways, it is 99, or what is that? 98.5% accurate. Um, that's just in five years. Um, th these are three separate tests. And you can see how far we've come from 2013 to 2018 just ridiculously good. Here's one of those Chinese vendors. You always hear about those Chinese vendors and how good their facial recognition is. That's that's one of them, um, E2. Uh, so the, the other one is, is an absolute accuracy test. And you can see Microsoft won this across the board with ridiculously good accuracy in facial recognition. 99%, 99.5% 99 accuracy, 99. 8% accuracy. Um, that that to, to me is, is just amazing. The problem is not everybody has this good accuracy in their facial recognition algorithms. And we'll get to that in a second. So let me give you a demo to show you how powerful this stuff is. I have to turn my video off. 
which I will now do because I'm going to give it to my computer. And little disclaimer, um, I'm over, I'm at home. Uh, I showed you that. Uh, uh, at, at the office, I'd have a lot more bandwidth and this wouldn't be so choppy, but we're just going to have to survive. I, I hope you're okay. I'm going to send video uh, to you guys over the over the um, internet here. This is, if I could bring it into frame, this is uh, actually a test container. This is an application that we use um, to, to do benchmark testing on a number of facial recognition algorithms and a lot of machine learned computer vision algorithms. Um, but, but we prettied it up because salespeople love to do it and I love to demo this thing um, live. So first thing to notice is uh, it's doing a facial recognition on me and you can see it's doing pretty well. It's saying I'm 84% confident that it's Tim it's saying Tim is 58. I got to put my glasses on. 58 years old and he's a male. Hey, guess what? I'm 58. Um, so it's doing a darn good job. This is using the Windows algorithm. Um, in fact, I can show you that we're doing it. We're se we're sending these images up to the cloud. Here's the weakness here. This has nothing to do with ethics, but the Microsoft algorithms run in the cloud, so it's taking the you know a crop of my face and sending it up to the interweb, getting the results and turning them back. Let me switch to running this locally on the edge on my CPU. So we've now switched from the Microsoft algorithm to Intel's OpenVINO, and it's running completely in the edge. And you can see it's doing pretty good, just not as good. And it's, man, it's not being kind to me today. 62, ouch. Uh, I also am not in the best lit room. You can see it's super dark behind me. I don't have any professional lighting or anything like that. In fact, I don't even have the lights on. I have the sun coming in the, the window in front of me. Um, so let me show you this though. Let's see if we can get this demo to work. I'm I'm switching back to um, the Microsoft algorithm. I'm looking for sunglasses. Okay, so I don't have a trained image of me in the database with sunglasses. So let's just do a test. We're going to do a test live. I'm going to put on sunglasses. Matt, now I can see the latency. Of course, I can't see if it's working, but I think it's saying it's recognizing me. Is it? Yeah. So it's now saying, hey, I'm 54% accurate that that's Tim, even though uh, he's wearing sunglasses. I put a hat on. This is called occlusion when you occlude the face. I put a hat on, and you, it, which darkens my eyes because of the sunlight, and it's still doing a darn good job. Now, here's the, the really crazy test that we've been working on. And uh, disclaimer, sometimes this doesn't work. Uh, here we go. This is very common in in my part of the world, and I'm sure your part of the world right now. And and okay, that's awesome. That is fantastic. So you can see it got a fifty per fifty eight percent accuracy with even with me wearing a mask, fifty four. Even with me wearing a mask and occluding half my face. Guess what? I'm not going to do it, but I put, if I put the mask on, put the sunglasses on and the hat, it's going to go. I, I don't even know what the hell that is. That doesn't even look like a human to me. OK, just just to set expectations. Uh, I should also show you this while I'm here. I'm going to switch from my camera that's on my um, Surface Book. I'm going to switch to an IP camera, uh, a network camera, a surveillance camera, similar to you, you would see in your airport in Oslo. Uh, and, and you can see, even though, man, I look uh, pretty washed out, it's still doing a darn good job facially recognizing me um, because the algorithm is not that is good. You know, typically in computer vision input, good inputs produce good outputs. And in this case, the contrast is so bad, it's still doing a good job. Now, check this out. Watch this. I'm going to back up. So excuse the mess in my office. Can you all relate to this? We all. So some of us have messy offices, and this is certainly one of them at home. So I'm going to back up. I don't know if you can hear me, and I definitely can't see the UI because I'm so far away. Um, but it's done the, um, the face detection. With all the crap that's in this room, it's done the face detection on me. And see how tiny my face is? 
I, I believe, I can't see that far, but I believe, yeah, it said from that far away, I can tell that's Tim at 79%. What does that mean? That means we can look out into a crowd with a good lens on a good network camera. We can look into a crowd and look for bad guys. Um, or bad guys can do bad things by looking into a crowd from very long distances. There are $10,000 cameras that we have tested with that do amazing accuracy from, what is it, like a thousand meters away. Just amazing stuff. Uh, I don't need to show, go into Outlook and show you that it sent an alert, do I? It, it did. This is an example of alert. This was from um, a couple days ago. I did a test this morning really early that it recognized me. Um, we alert security systems. We can alert by email, text, API, NATS, bus, uh, pub sub type systems, things like that. Um, all right, so I told you every any developer can do this. I told you the Microsoft algorithm is available. Yeah, any, but this is just a REST API. It, anybody can, any developer do this easily on any platform. It's in any language for free. Um, if you put it in production, Microsoft wants you to pay for it and it's cheap. It's uh, a US penny per 1600 transactions or something like that. Um, if you make a mistake, that adds up, but you know, it, it's pretty darn cheap. So. Why use these things? Um, they're all cloud services. They're available on Azure. They're they're inexpensive. They're they're tested. Microsoft uses them themselves in their own products. They're easy. They're flexible. Um, there's a breadth of intelligence and knowledge APIs in the Microsoft Cognitive Stack. I guess they call it the Azure Cognitive Stack too. And Microsoft eats its own dog food. I, I can't say enough. The, the very same algorithm that that uh, they use in Windows Hello and all throughout the organization is the one available to you. Okay, so let's switch real quickly to another demo. And we're going to switch from... Uh, should I turn my camera back on? I probably should. So you can see me. So that would be here. Um, so we're going to switch from the recognition of humans, which can be everything from facial recognition to face detection, to body counting, to engagement, to dwell times, to, you know, just whatever a human would do. Uh, a gesture where they, they go like this, like they're in the bank. Can you see me going like this, like touchdown? Um, you know, hands up, you're in a bank or, or down, all that stuff. Let's switch to the next generation of computer vision to be solved and that's object recognition this is the azure portal for microsoft custom vision microsoft custom vision is a poor name for this this uh product it should be called object recognition or object detection or something like that but it's called custom vision it's the tech they use uh, or extend to us by rest api to recognize common objects you can see that i have uh, put 24 pictures of a bottle of Coke in here, you know, 29 Pepsis. And I've trained this model historically. Like if we go back 10 years ago, you would train hundreds of thousands of images. But I basically have about 25 to 30 each. Makes sense? If I do a little quick test and I go out here and look at a local file, now I'm going to there, now I'm going to look for uh what would i call that how about computer vision pictures there we go okay here here's a picture of a coke this picture is not trained this is outside the training set so all those pictures you saw a minute ago are in the training set this is a new one and it should come up and say i'm a hundred percent confident or close and it did 99 percent confident that's cool let me just show you another one it is fairly interesting. Yeah, here's a picture of a Coke can with a polar bear on it. You know, the Coca-Cola company during Christmas time does some pretty creative stuff. There's nothing that I have trained that has a polar bear on it and it's sideways. So you could see it's not as confident. It's 60% confident, but guess what? Uh, if I now go over into predictions and I take that polar bear image and I tag it 
as a um I tag it as a uh Coke can. Got it? I just tagged it through a UI. You know, I'm not writing any I'm not writing any uh that's fine because we're not gonna do a training. I'm not writing any code. I'm not doing any scripting like you would do in TensorFlow or anything like that. I just tag it, and if I click train, I'm not going to do that because it takes a couple minutes, and we just end up staring at it do its training. Then it would recognize this Coke can with a hundred percent accuracy the next time it did it. I'm doing this all through a UI, and then you just grab the REST call from this interface, put it into your application in any language, uh, and off you go. And you could see my model, the the AP uh, precision is basically says. Precision is basically seven out of ten, 10 times we get it right in that 70 percent or we're at 100. So 10 out of 10, we get it. Recall is like 50. If we have 15 Cokes and we recognize 10 of them, that's 67 percent recall. Well, you know, we've got 100 percent recall. This is like the AP is a combined percentage. It's overall model per performance. So this particular model is bulletproof. Again, you could do this as a developer. Is that a good thing? that any developer can do this? You know, what if you were recognizing something sensitive? Uh, well, let's just move on and we'll, we'll get deeper into the, the ethics of this stuff. Okay, moving all right along. So I think it's important to categorize where we see artificial intelligence emerging and most predominantly the use cases that these are, are sucked into this i actually stole this slide from um steve guggenheimer he's been at microsoft for over 30 years he's in the ai group uh amazing guy brilliant guy uh and uh um anyways i stole it from him so i should give him credit so categorizing this helps us to clarify how ai helps the world but also to clarify the attack surface for ethical violations so virtual agents these are like synthetic virtual people like bots that uh, have the capability of chatting with you or even talking with you. This is where deep fakes lives. And we'll talk about deep fakes in a minute um, in depth. Uh, that, that's, that's the scariest part uh, to me about the power, the bad use of artificial intelligence. Ambient intelligence is where I live the most in my professional career. That's using computer vision to interpret um, um, the, what the computer's seeing and having software react to what the computer sees or what these machine learned algorithms sees. This is where people cry privacy law fouls. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want my face biometrically uh, recognized by a random uh, governmental camera because that's an invasion of my privacy. They're also saying, these computer vision algorithms are are racially discriminated and that that's in the us if you're watching the news you know what's going on in the us uh there is a large group of people saying that the police are using um um algorithms that are racially biased uh assisting professionals this is the ability to use ai to accelerate training teaching and learning obvious use case uh, but imagine AI teaching you how to launder money or commit cyber crimes, and you may not even know you're doing it. You may be doing it for someone else, uh, or worse yet, you do know you're doing it. Uh, autonomous systems, these are the, the most common use cases, self-driving vehicles, um, or, or using computers to detect patterns is another one. Um, but imagine a world where you hijack a vehicle or a train or a ship with a dignitary in it. Um, that that definitely is is a security thing that could be an issue, um, is an issue going forward. So let me tell you up front that I'm invested in this company and Internology builds this company's, um, um, high, it does the heavy lifting, the, the computer vision for this, this company. This is visibility. Um, internally, we call uh, the product suite uh, by the names of fish. So for instance, King Salmon is is uh what i showed you earlier that little test container um externally it's three products uh it does computer vision all over the world i'm not going to demo it for you because it's manifested through digital signage and you don't want to stare at coke and pepsi ads right you want to know about what happens behind the scenes now listen to me carefully 
This runs around the world. Um, it does not run in Norway, and it does not run in a number of places in Europe yet because of strict privacy law. So this company respects that. There are uh, three modes of operation. Through computer vision, we set up virtual zones that are configurable. That outer zone, that entice zone, typically that's 20 feet, 20 to 30 feet away. What happens here is, and you know this from your, from, from your, own, from your own cities where you live, in digital signage, it's typically beautiful people doing beautiful things. So beautiful women dancing around in mini skirts, holding Pepsi or whatever, um, or beautiful males eating beautiful foods or wh whatever the CPG computer uh, consumer package good company is targeting at you. Well, in this software, it runs that beautiful people doing beautiful thing. But the minute you look at the screen, it does a biometric read on you and changes the content or it can change the content based on what it sees. So imagine beautiful Scandinavians doing beautiful things in the content and an Asian walks in front of it. It the content suddenly changes to beautiful Asians doing beautiful things. That is creepy. Well, sort of creepy. It's not really dangerous, but it's sort of creepy. But guess what? It's wildly effective, wildly effective. There are there are certain demographics and they're slightly different around the world. We're not allowed to talk about the, the most influenceable um, demographic, but one might assume I have a daughter that fits in that demographic that are very influenceable. I'm an old white guy. If if Beyonce drinks Diet Pepsi. I don't care. I'm I'm not going to change to Diet Pepsi because Beyonce drinks Diet Pepsi. It's you know I'm not that influenceable. My demographic, there's a demographic that is influenceable. So um, how's this used for good? It's getting bad guys to look. It's identifying bad guys. In fact, we nailed a um, a um, um, what was a mass murderer guy that had escaped from prison in South Africa the other day, and he essentially walked into a convenience store. And, you know, we got like a, I don't know, 70% confidence. We sent the alert to the authorities and they got him. They arrested him. So this stuff is used for good, but just understand it can do um, some biometric stuff that are, let's just say, interesting. So from a. Uh, excuse me, Tim, if I could just interject. Uh, the active webcam is your Surface Book. Just so you know. Not okay, the camera. Right. The active ca webcam you have is the Surface Book and not the uh, camera on your left. Yeah. Is that bad? Uh, you, you just keep looking into the left one. Uh, oh. oh, sorry. Actually, I'm gazing out the window while I'm talking so I can contact. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Continue. I love the interaction. No problem. It's here. We're, we're here. How about that? All right. Good. So I'm not going to demo this, but uh, this stuff runs in professional sports stadiums all around the world. Th this is uh, uh, the, the United States NFL, what we call football. You do not. Um, but suffice it to say, uh, the attack surface for a stadium holding 100,000 people is enormous. If you're a bad guy, a really bad guy, what's more tantalizing? killing a hundred thousand people in a stadium or shooting an airplane out of the sky and getting 300. so yeah this runs in your country all and all over the world because the attack surface of people in concerts or sporting events is so good um or so big i should say not good that's a bad way to say it so it's looking for bad guys you are being looked at whether you like it or not um, you are being looked at, but in a security safety type way. And I think any anyone, if they really diagnose this closely, they'd be say they'd say, okay, to be safe, to be safer, I'm okay with my face being looked at if I go into a stadium. All this stuff is gathered, you know, into in a retail context. All this stuff is gathered into, you know, Azure SQL data warehouses or AWS SQL, uh, data warehouses, and reported on and to the most intricate detail, so that data scientists can can examine, you know, who whose product is being looked at, 
um, and and, tar and change advertising based on that. So you want to know what scares me the most about artificial intelligence? Deep fakes. Th th I already mentioned this. Uh, w if you don't know what deep fakes are, we, we see deep fakes in movies really frequently now. Princess Leia in Star Wars was done quite effectively long after the actress Carrie Fisher passed away. Uh, U.S. presidents and famous actors have been spoofed multiple times in videos and social media with deep fakes. But consider this world. Consider a world where you get a phone call from your mother and she says she's in trouble and needs money wired to her immediately. You, you converse with her, you talk to her in context and she answers you back in context in the exact voice pattern of your mother. But it's not your mother and you're absolutely convinced that you're talking to your mother. This is scary stuff and this can be done. This type of technology in AI is real. There's an, there's an infamous story within the walls of Microsoft that is never made public of a demo and an internal event where the Microsoft research group showed this exact thing. They showed an interactive conversation between two virtual people, virtual CEO Satya Nadella and virtual number two guy at Microsoft, Scott Guthrie, the, the head of Azure. And they were having an interactive virtual conversation while the real Satya and the real Scott watched on stage with their mouths, with their jaws dropped. Uh, both real Scott and real Satya then started talking to their virtual counterparts in context. Uh, machine learning was done on their voice patterns and on everything they ever said publicly off the internet. So their virtual selves could converse and do an answer in, tech, in context. This technology was immediately killed at Microsoft and has never seen the light of day because it's so dangerous. Um, this is the type of thing we're facing in the future from bad people, and, and it's going to be hard. Grandma Huckabee is going to have a tough time dealing with deep, deep fakes for sure. So how did this AI thing happen? Sure, there were significant achievements in software and machine learning, but really this whole revolution came about because your CPUs got more powerful. Simple as that. Ridiculously powerful and continue to get powerful at a shocking pace. This is Dr. Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, one of my personal heroes. I've never met him. He's still with us. I would love to meet him. Um, Moore, Dr. Moore made a law when he was like a 23 year old 60 years ago. It was really just a prediction, an uncanny prediction that has been continued to be accurate for almost 60 years. So, Check out, this is Moore's Law uh, on the on the Y axis, that is 50 trillion transistors. Moore's Law was basically what Dr. Moore said when he was a young man in a magazine article, he, he described a trend. And that was, I'm noticing that twice as many transistors are being crammed onto a circuit board every two years. And he predicted that that would continue for another 10 years. It's, con it's continued for s almost 60 years. What that equates to is how many transistors we have on a CPU. That's 50 trillion transistors on the current gen Intel CPUs. On, on the Y axis, on the X axis is time. Um, that translates to computing power. Here's Moore's law as mapped against calculations and time and the speed of the brain of mammals. So on the left or on the on the y axis, you have a hundred trillion uh, a hundred trillion calculations per second, which is basically the speed of the human brain. And you can see right now, because of Moore's law, our current gen CPUs are calculating at the speed of small rodents like mice and hares and rabbits. In 2025, look at that intersection. Our CPUs in 2025 will be calculating at the speed of the human brain. That doesn't mean the singularity. That doesn't mean machines are taking over. That means unbelievable power, the, the type of power 
to make a blind man see type power in artificial intelligence. Check this out. This is this is our tech. This is our IP. This is probably going to be patented. We're, we're it, this is doing face identification into a crowd, and it is seeing you know. I'm, God help anyone to count all these little green boxes that it's seen faces on, but it's I'm guessing that's like 500 faces. Now, obviously, this is a, a high quality camera that took this picture, but our face detection algorithms, and there's a combination of three of them, Intel's, Microsoft's, and another one, has identified all these faces. So what does this mean? If we were now to do a facial recognition and look for a bad guy in the crowd, we could not do this in real time. Even at the edge, we don't have enough CPU power. On the most powerful CPUs, which would be a i7 Gen 10, this would take, I'm guessing, because I honestly don't remember the benchmarking, this would take about 30 seconds to process all these images. Clearly not real time, because we just don't have the power. Okay, make sense? All right, so what the heck does all this have to do with the movie Avatar? I think you'll find this interesting. Um, yeah, Avatar was released almost a decade ago. And it was an amazing movie with beautiful blue people, and the CGI was just awesome. But to pull it off, to render the movie, basically took the world's most powerful computers, thousands of them, running 24-7 for over a month. A single frame of this movie often took several, several hours simply just to render. And that's because 10 years ago, that was the computing power. This movie was so successful that after um, it was released, they immediately wrote Avatar 2. James Cameron, you know, he's kind of a famous guy. I, I, I'm not much of a movie guy, but I assume you've heard of James Cameron, top right. He said they immediately wrote it because it was so successful. They could have made a ton of money on it doing the same way. But he said, we're not doing this until we have computers powerful enough to render this movie quickly so that we can make changes and, and, you know, and edit and do all the stuff they couldn't do on the first movie, and that we could make these blue people more realistic so they actually look like biological entities. He's been waiting for over a decade for computers to get powerful enough. The software's there. So um, at the end of this year, you're going to see Avatar 2 come out. Hopefully by the end of this year, we'll be able to go into movie theaters. But Avatar 2 is scheduled to come out uh, because computers are now powerful and he can render this movie on December 18th of this year. I hope you find that interesting. Uh, so um, how am I doing on time? You know what? I'm going to skip this demo because I've pontificated a little too much. This demo shows you. I'll just talk to it because it, the screenshot does a good job. Right here, bottom left, um, it's saying, I know it's really hard to see, but this, this is one of our test containers for running computer vision algorithms on the edge on Intel OpenVINO's machine learning runtime for the compute edge that running directly on the CPU, not doing the Azure cloud thing, right? The, on the bottom right, it's saying frames per second 4.3 in a 1280 by 720 resolution. HD is 30 frames a second. You may know that, you probably know that. But Windows takes a ton of resources. So Windows is only giving this application 4.3 frames a second. That's important because if you wanna be really accurate, if you're looking for Osama bin Laden and you want your accuracy above 80%, you want to take as many frames out of the image as possible. You want to process the hell out of that, right? Uh, but Windows and Linux are, well, actually Linux does a little better because it doesn't have all that device overhead. But Windows is only giving this application 4.3 frames a second. On this older gen, this was an i5 Gen 6, Gen 5. It was only processing, and it's doing like 12, uh, computer vision algorithms from face detection to facial recognition to um, gender, 
age. It's doing a whole bunch of stuff, like 12 of them. It's only processing a 0.1 frames per second. So it's not even keeping up with the camera. If I were to do this demo right now for you, you can see that it with the CPU I have on this Surface Book 2, it keeps up with the camera. But Windows still only gives it about, I don't know, 8 to 10 frames a second. I hope that makes sense. Here, let me show you this one. I can show you this one real quickly without spinning up a giant Win32 app. Uh, that is probably here. Yeah, uh, this is live. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to zoom in on Mexico City. This, um, these guys are using our tech. Zoom in. These guys are using our tech to look for the bad guy. This is called, this is a smart city implementation. And these little red, red things are the implementation of cameras and uh, CPUs all throughout Mexico City. Uh, this, I, I could click one of these. Oh God, I'm not, I'm not gonna grab all that bandwidth to get a live feed from a, you know, in a, a residential area in Mexico City. This is a demo part of the app, but that that part's live. These are not real bad guys. These are these are like the some of the engineers and people on the pro project in Mexico City. Anyways, this has been well publicized throughout Mexico City. Um, that hey, we're in the neighborhoods, we have cameras, and we're looking for bad guys. And um, um, just the simple fact that it's been publicized. The entire country of Mexico is begging to have this in their own um, neighborhoods because guess what happened? Crime reduced immediately to 40%. 40% drop in crime simply with the knowledge of the bad guys knowing they're being watched. So these people are actually begging for this, which is a lot different in terms of ethics to, hey, I want to be facially recognized because I want to be safe. That's a lot different from the people of, uh, or, or some people in San Francisco saying, that's a privacy violation. I do not ever want to be facially recognized. Um, I think that's interesting. I, I also should have said up front, it's in the abstract, that there are no right or wrong answers to this. This just poses questions. All this stuff just poses questions and really interesting conversation tonight, hopefully, with Aquavit. Um, so this just happened this week. I, I think this is fascinating. This is what I call reverse ethics abuse. These are the largest companies in the world pretending like they're the most ethically awesome companies in the world and, and doing good for the world. Uh, this all went down two days ago. First, IBM says, hey, we're getting out of the facial recognition um, uh, business. Um, um, so, uh, what, what happens is, is, you know, IBM's tech is just not that good. And in reality, IBM's global services uses Microsoft's facial recognition technology. So when they say, oh, we're getting out of the facial recognition database, you know, it's like, hey, come on. And the press kind of, kind of caught on to this. Um, but, but. <laughs> Six or eight hours later, Amazon comes in and set, hops on the ethical bandwagon and says it's banning its own facial recognition technology. But it's only doing it for a year. It, that sounds really altruistic also, doesn't it? Well, Amazon's facial rec recognition tech is the one that was used in the controversial San Francisco Police Department pilot, a complete failure because it's not that good. Um, in fact, it's so poor that the project was a complete failure and naive politicians in San Francisco, California immediately assumed that all facial recognition technology is bad and made facial recognition for the police illegal, taking away their tools. The NIST that I talked about earlier, the standards, the standards organization begged Amazon to officially submit their algorithms for testing and Amazon declined for obvious reasons. Notice the comment from the writer. Uh, critics, critics call the one year moratorium merely a stunt. So even the press is getting savvy to this stuff. Um, so here's the press. Just hours later, the press starting to figure out that these, these from these giant companies, these look to be like public relations ploys. And 
jumping on this ethical bandwagon hoping to avoid PR backlashes. So this is the one that bothers me the most. The next day, Microsoft. Uh, I, 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 I'm not buddies with Brad Smith, but I know him, I've met him. He's a great guy. He's a, just and a super smart guy and his staff are just super sharp people. So Microsoft comes out and they say, all right, we're not selling facial recognition to the police. This is yesterday, by the way. So, but I could walk down the street to the Carlsbad police st station and sell a facial recognition solution to the Carlsbad police myself based on Microsoft's facial recognition tech. You could walk down to the local Oslo police department and do the same thing on Microsoft's tech. IBM uses Microsoft's tech. So when Microsoft says they're not selling to the police, well, if I sell to the police and I'm using their tech and they're still making money on it, you know, then how, 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 well, you see the problem. <laughs> so, unfortunately, this is a part, a part of our world. Um, this is the world, this isn't just a U.S. thing. This is certainly in Scandinavia. This is an in international thing. We just have crazy people and they do crazy things here in the U.S., nutcases run into schools and they start shooting people. Um, let me tell you how we're uh, using AI hoping to help. Um, I love what we call projects of ethics. This is my project. I've been working on this one for over a year and, and I shouldn't say I, we, uh, there are some very smart people involved in this. This is real time weapon detection. And um, if this thing, I built the prototype helps prevent one crazy guy from shooting kids at a school, then it's a million times worth all the effort we're putting into it. Projects like this are a blueprint for why the goodness of AI far outweighs the potential badness of AI. So let me show it to you. Um, I'm going to run that container again. Bear with me, or I'm going to run that test container again, I should say. What am I doing? Oh, good. I'm going to come in on time so you get you guys off on time. Uh, it takes a while to spin up. Hang on one second. Almost there. So um, in my part of the world, we this is a heavy populated city between San Diego, um, Orange County, and um, oh, shoot. I forgot to turn off my screen. God darn it. Or my, I forgot to turn off my video. Hang on, I'll do that now. Okay, video off, let's run this thing again. So where I live uh, in San Diego County, um, north of us is Orange County. North of that is Los Angeles. It's basically a 200 mile by 50 mile city. That is, uh, let me do the kilometer thing. That is what, three, 300 kilometers by, 300,000 kilometers by 150,000 kilometers? It's, it's, what is it? It's close to 50 million people. What's my point? Uh, there are, uh, I don't own a gun. There's no hunting here. The only people here that have guns are bad guys, right? So I'm not going to stick a gun in a camera today. And I realize this is going to be a little choppy because we're, we're sending uh, video feeds across. I'm going to show you pictures of people with guns. So let me go back to the UI. I'm going to turn on weapon recognition and I'll hold a picture of a weapon up to my screen. And I'll put myself in the picture too. And I hope this is coming across, but it immediately, what I'm looking at is immediate, immediately came across, it ID'd me really well. It ID'd the pistol with 80% accuracy, 80.9, 84% accuracy, 86% accuracy. And then it says that's a 31 um, year old female. I trust you, you assume that's awesome because it is. It's awesome. This, this is just software, right? So this can run on, oh, we're just grabbing frames from cameras. So here in the US where, where there's 20 year old um, 
uh, surveillance cameras in the school parking lots, yeah, it still works. Inputs and outputs. If we go to get a, get a good input, and you can get a good input from an older camera, we can get a good output. So if some crazy guy run, goes into a parking lot of a shopping mall or a school or a sporting event or a concert and brandishes a weapon, we can nail it. 88% uh, confident. So now that you see that it works, let me go to my favorite, which is Agent Scully. And I'm not much of a um, TV and movie guy, so I... Jillian something is this actress's name. I can't remember her name. Anyway, she's holding two guns. So let me just make the point that, yeah, remember that that image of the crowd where we saw all those faces? Well, this works the same way. If there's a crowd and 100 people have guns, we'll see them all. And you can see right here, I guess I have to lower it, that it's nailing both pistols. I hope you can see that. Um, at really good accuracy. 84% and above. It's also recognizing me and it's recognizing Jillian as 27 years old. All right. Cool, huh? Make sense? All right. That's AI for good. Let's wrap this up with something for you guys to think about on a Friday night. That's interesting. Uh, so yeah, I don't need to demo this, but while I was doing that live, it was generating email alerts. Um, and again, we can alert on API, we can alert on, on, on a Nats bus, which is PubSub or, or text or whatever. So as technologists, we have an ethical responsibility to push AI to places where it really helps the world. And I've showed you some places where it helps the world. And I showed you some places where it truly is a nuclear weapon and terrifying. These two books written by Orwell, Orwell and Huxley, I don't know if you know them, but they portrayed a dystopian view of the future of the world, a world run by machines. AI has the power to be big brother. It really does. But it also has the power to save lives, uh, whether it be cancer detection and research or recognizing weapons or, or other stuff we haven't thought about. Like any technology, we, us technology people, us developers, we have a responsibility, we have a duty to spread awareness of the ethics of this type of power. I like to explain AI to the non-technologists, like my wife, um, uh, and I've been married for 31 years. I compare it to nuclear power. What did nuclear power give us? It gave us the microwave oven. You probably don't use it in Norway, but in the, in the US, <laughs> it's the basis of cooking. Um, it gave us inexpensive energy and propulsion, and it also killed a gazillion people and and some of the countries of the world use it to threaten the, the, the free world with weapons. Uh, conversely, in artificial intelligence, it, it can make our lives easier, it can teach us quicker, it can automate the menial tasks that humans don't want to do. Uh, it entertains us in movies and it saves lives. It also replaces people. You know, we're, we're here in the U.S. I don't know about in Scandinavia, but we keep talking about restaurants that don't have people in them, where people don't work. They just, you know, machines and software deliver you food. Uh, it's also a tool for bad guys, um, whether it be fraud or killing people. It can be used to help that. So. Are you willing up to give up? There's no right answers to this, but think about this. Are you willing to give up your privacy to be more safe? Uh, before COVID-19, much of the privacy laws all over the world, especially in Europe and the US, strictly restricted and prohibited unauthorized biometric analysis of the face. After this pandemic, in most of the free world, you won't be able to go into any office building, retail store, airport, restaurant, whatever, without computer vision algorithms looking at you and they're going to look at you to measure your body temperature because if you have a temperature you have the potential to have COVID. that is becoming law here in the us and from what i read it's going to be the law in um, your country too and well throughout europe do you trust governmental authorities to, to use biometric biometrical analysis of your face in public places we already know that plenty of the world's governments have done some tracking of people 
that would raise an eyebrow, some bad stuff. Um, yet, I don't think any of us would mind if government authorities like the police had the right tools that would help us keep safe. Why did local and state and federal privacy laws conflict with each other? This probably isn't true in Norway because you're not as screwed up as us in the US, but we have conflicting privacy law here. What's legal here in Carlsbad, California might be illegal in, in California itself, which might be legal federally in the United States. That's kind of the way our government is set up and it's ridiculous. That's why Microsoft is demanding the United States federal government and the European Union and governments around the world to get some regulation around this stuff. Do you trust the Googles and the Facebooks and the Apples and the Microsofts and the myriad of other companies that are tracking you and looking at you and buying when you're buying and searching on the internet? Shouldn't this be an opt-in thing? Yeah, there's, there's use cases where I'd welcome having my shopping habits be tracked if I'm gonna get something out of it, like a coupon or something free, but I, I don't want to be arbitrarily tracked. I really don't. Um, do you believe the statements, humans make decisions, AI is just a tool to help humans make decisions? When we get to a world where AI starts making decisions, that's where we have problems. This already happens right now. Insurance companies, even in your company, have used have not used humans in making policy and rate decisions for over 75 years. In the US, the rates, the rates for insurance are based on the color of your skin and they continue to do this. And it's allowed. Another, and that's not, that, that's something we need to get our arms around. And then lastly, should, should us common developers have access easily to implement these types of tools? I say yes. I say yes, as long as we, we, enlighten the developer community that, hey, we have an ethical responsibility not to do bad things. There's going to be outliers. There's going to be bad people, but minimizing those is the key. All right, so there it is. I'm two minutes late. I, I almost did it. Um, here's what we talked about today. In summary, it's right there in the middle. With, with the great power of AI comes great responsibility. The next decade is going to be interesting for us developers because we are going to have access to the most powerful most powerful tool sets in ai Alrighty, i'm done if you want my powerpoint deck or anything else or you want to talk about this there's my email address there's my mobile phone uh feel free to do that um that's it thank you for attending and um i don't know what the rule is gregor but it's only 8.23 in the morning, so if you want to take questions, I'm more than willing to.